Hello and welcome to this presentation by Empiris as a tutorial at the RISC V Summit December 2020, a virtual event. What we're going to talk about in this tutorial is getting started with RISC V verification. My name is Simon Davidman and I'm also going to be joined by my colleague Lee Moore. We're both from Empiris Software. In this tutorial today, there's going to be several things that, that we'd like you to try and um, understand and as, have takeaways um, from it. First is we're going to talk about verification and the challenges in uh, verifying a RISC-V CPU. We're going to talk a little bit about the status of RISC-V compliance and how that relates to verification. Also, we want you to understand a little bit about the issues related to reference models and simulators and actually the components that fit around in, in, a, in a verification environment and what you need in your test bench. Talk a little bit about instruction stream generators and then give some pointers to some some free uh, architectural validation tests that are there and then actually we're going to do a detailed walkthrough so to give you a feel for what a, what a real production test bench looks like that does very sophisticated verification okay but first what i'd like to do is introduce Imperis and our involvement with risk 5. so we're a developer of simulators and tools that work around simulators. We focus on the models and modeling technology. And our target is to focus on the embedded systems developer, people building electronic products who have to get their hardware to work and get their software running. We've been around over 12 years, self-funded, profitable, UK-based. Most of our experience come from EDA technologies and processor uh, companies. We've Staff have worked in ARM, MIPS, Tensilica on the on the processor IP side of things and on the cadence synopsis on the EDA side of things. And on the EDA side of things, it's been focused all on, all on verification to do with the Verilog simulators, the languages, VCS, System Verilog, um, uh, technologies like Verity Specman that are from cadence and the methodologies related to these. We started work on RISC-V in 2017 with customers. We got involved in compliance in 2018 and our whole focus really in RISC V is on CPU verification. And we provide these configurable reference models and the fastest high quality simulators and advanced development tools. And absolutely, we have the best solution for RISC V hardware DV. More than 20 companies use our technology and rely on us. So let's talk a little bit about CPU verification, the challenges and the process. So RISC V, it's a new ISA, it's a new open standard managed by RISC V International. Because it's open, anybody can design a processor with it and they can actually all be slightly different. And we believe there's over 100 designs at the moment out there. Now, in terms of traditional verification, the processor IP comes from and is maintained by a single ISA owner and it comes fully verified. So all you have to do is the integration tests of it. And there's currently no sort of normal way or a standard methodology of how you do processor verification. And there are a few uh, public available tools available. But the challenge is people like ARM, they do verification to ensure their devices are compliant. So they will run 10 to the 15 petacycles of tests on their devices to ensure they're compliant. So the RISC-V industry, in, industry and ecosystem has to try and understand the practices of, and the best practices of hardware verification and adapt those to processor verification. So there's really a lot to learn about RISC-V from a verification point of view. So let's talk a little bit about the hardware DV process. So the first thing you've got to do is find the right people to work on it with you as a team. You then got to develop a verification plan and that's really important. So you've got to work out what needs to be verified and how you're going to measure that verification. You've also got to determine what tools and methods you're going to use, what languages you're going to use, what simulators, what, what verification technologies you're going to use and how much you're going to spend on it because you know emulation can be quite expensive in that. You've got to get the tools, you've got to get the test bench, you've got to get the models in place. Then you've got to get hold of tests, then you've got to do lots and lots of random testing. And then you've got to do a lot of verification and measuring and ensuring you're achieving what you need to do before you get close to the tape out to sign off. And you have to benchmark, soak test and do integration testing. Okay, let's now have a look at um, RISC-V compliance and a little bit about reference simulators and formal models.
So Risk 5 International has a variety of different working groups. One of them is the Compliance Task Group. The charter of the task group is really a threefold. The first is to develop compliance tests so that implementations can be tested and checked. Initially, different uh, architectural versions and standard extensions. And the focus is to have tests for all of the extensions. To also develop a method for selecting and configuring the tests so that you can take into account the environment that they run in and the different architectures. And then to also develop a framework to make sure the appropriate tests are run and, and, and verified so that you can check that your device under test using a signature is the same as a reference model. Now, the tests are really are an evolving set, so it's changing a lot. It's still in the very early days for it. So you can select your profile and, and it should select the tests that you need to run. And the real purpose is to ensure that the implementer has really understood both um, the uh, has understood the specification. Now, they're meant to be a sort of a minimal filter. So passing the tests is requirement so that you can get the blessing of RISC-5 International for licensing trademarks and things. But by passing the test, it does not mean that any design really complies with the architecture. They're a very basic set of tests and it's not a substitute for rigorous design verification. So it's really just a check. Now, the RISC-5 International has um, a GitHub repo, RISC-5 compliance in there. And then there's a variety of different things. And one of the directories that's interesting is the target directory. And that lists the different um, models that currently use the, um, the tests and have, have committed some, some files up to the repo to make it easy for other people to use it. And also uh, reference simulators and other simulators. If we look here, there is a a model, the sale model, and if I just go to this, so the Risk Five organization wanted a formal model of its ISA, and a selection was made over five or six different formal models to go with the sale model out of the University of Cambridge, and that is been adopted now by the Risk Five International to be um, the reference for Risk Five. Now, if we look at the um, back to the repo, we can see that you know there, there was a directory, the targets, and in there we could see that that's where the, um, the sale model was, also the Imperial Simpris 5 OVP sims in there. Another interesting directory in there is the test suite, and that really lists the current test suites there, and you can see the standard 32-bit uh, base ISAs are, are in this one. And if you look in there, you can see the uh, source files, uh, the assembler source files, to, um, to be able to run the test, they are, that is the test, and also a reference, which is a signature to show what you're actually expecting to get out of it. And then the framework actually does the differences for you. In any verification environment, there are many required technologies. First thing you're going to need is a reference modeling that has all the ISA extensions and modes and it needs to be extendable and fully configurable. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You're also going to need different simulators for different parts of the job that you'd have. You're going to need to build platforms up so you can simulate not just the specific processor but actually software that runs on it and operating systems. And you're going to need some form of verification IP models, synchronization technology, instruction generators. So let's talk about reference models. Now, a reference model is a different thing to an instruction set simulator. An instruction set simulator is typically pretty simplistic and normally inflexible and often, you know, it's relatively simple to build. So it can be good for some use models, but it's not much good for advanced verification. For advanced verification, you need a very sophisticated model. It has to implement the full specification and it has to be configurable to be exactly what you've got in your design under test. So for example, our Imperius reference models, we've got over 130 different options to set just to try and make our envelope model be configured to be what you've actually put in your silicon. And all of those are legal parts of the specification. And it has to be configurable for the different versions because these specifications evolve. Yeah, sure, they get ratified at some point, but you have to go to silicon at some point. And as something's evolving, you're gonna make a decision. So the specifications, you know, there's, I know, 10 different specifications and you've got to choose which version you implement in your RTL. So your reference model has to absolutely manage to match that for your verification. And often you want to extend 
uh, what's in the reference model to do with instructions and state and modes, asynchronous behavior. And having the source of the reference model is actually not good enough because you don't want to really make changes to the base model because then as things change in the base model, you have to maintain and update it and do your own uh, merging and, and, and keeping things up to date on your own fork repositories. And so that's no good at all. You really need a methodology and a technology so that the model can be built and evolve and extend. And previously, you really you want to have have your your models, your reference models have to be previously used by other people and, and gone to silicon. So it proves that they're correct. And ideally, the model's got to work in other environments. You do not want to run things standalone. You're going to want to work in your Verilog simulation environments, and you, you don't really want it done with pipes and sockets and all the stuff which you'd have to do with an executable. So ideally, it has to be a linkable mod, uh, object which is linked seamlessly without co-simulation into third-party simulation. And actually, our models have worked with pretty much any simulation environment out there, including MATLAB as well, which is not on that list. And a key thing about the model is it's got to be controllable, in terms of detailed state and all the operations. You've got to have every internal state be observable so you can validate things with it and the sequences of things. You need to be able to debug what's going on in your instructions, trigger on anything, trigger anything, include all source monitoring and, and everything to, to see it going. And you need to extend it. You need to be able to extend. So let's start to have a look at the simulators. First, the two free ones. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the RISC-V OVP sim simulator. Now, what I've done is I've gone to the uh, GitHub here, so you can see where it is, and we can see that we've come to the page here on here. And um, what this does is it includes the simulator itself, RISC-V OVP sim, and also some tests and things in there. So you know, RISC-V OVP sim takes an application, uh, compiled as an ELF, uh, it can do file I.O. Um, using semi-hosted file I.O. You configure and set up the model you want to run and you get an output file. And when you're running compliance, you get a signature file uh, for it in there. And inside the uh, um, the directory with risc 5 OVP sim in the, in the repository, you actually get the source of the, the model that comes with it. So you can have a look inside it and see how the instructions are um, are created and implemented here. This is an example of a crypto instruction. And it comes with a full uh, user guide so you can see what's in there. And what you can see is you can see the different versions of the uh, specifications that are implemented in the model. So for example, you know, the, uh, we have the basic sort of um, uh, user and privilege modes, but also you can see here, you know, the vector, we've had the original 0.71 all the way through to the, the, the current one, which is pretty close to up to date on a weekly basis. The same with the bit manipulation, also the crypto, and we have all the standard stuff. And this version of the simulator actually doesn't have uh, the hypervisor or the debug involved in it. So that's RISC-5 OVP SIM. The other simulator, RISC-5 OVP SIM Plus, is available from the um, OVP World webpage under the technology uh, page and that explains about RISC-5 OVP SIM and RISC-5 OVP SIM Plus. And when you go there, you can actually go uh, to the OVP World page and download it, which is actually um, what I've done here. And so what, what I've got here is uh, an example I'm going to show you. Um, so I've downloaded it uh, and gone into it. So uh, first thing we can do is just have a look and see what sort of files and things are there. So this is the uh, RISC-5 OVP SIM Plus itself that you get there. And we can we can, we can just run it up. And I've got a crib sheet on the left here to, to, so I can see. And we can get a help out of it. I've run the help command here out of it. And we can see the commands we've got for sort of controlling it when it finishes. We've got the coverage one, debug ones for running GDB and, and things like that, all the way through down to the uh, trace command so that we can, we can see how it runs. And we can see what's inside. Uh, the simulator, which models are available sort of off the shelf. So these are all the sort of pre-configured variants that we've currently got in this um, uh, example, uh, this uh, RISC-5 OVP sim. So we can go to the uh, examples directory and see what's there. We've got a variety of examples that come with it. If we go into the Fibonacci one and have a look at that, we can see that. And if we, uh, we can cat the file just to have a look at it. And you can see here that what we have is you know, very simple and it's sort of you have a main in it, a program, and it will run. And then when we actually compile it up and run it, it actually simulates as you'd expect, and it runs through. It ran, uh, that was 4.4 billion instructions there. Um, so that's a simple example. If we go to the dry stones and have a look at that there in the example there, and we can just run it 
run it through and it's going to run uh, some uh, 5 million uh, loops through there so it ran about 7 billion instructions there so it's quite fast this and so just a few other features in there we can run tracing put that on it so we can actually see the trace and our, uh, trace the the, the OVPC and traces are very sort of configurable and that you can see here we're seeing which mode we're in the disassembly uh, what the instruction count is and things like that we also have the ability to uh, run up a GDB with it just by putting a GDB on the on the, the end of the command here and then we can um, we've got access to a GDB to uh, to run the simulation to control it and debug it and do what we like um, with that you could use an eclipse based thing or anything and it also the simulator has a, a basic coverage uh, uh, analysis in it which it can simulate and here we just ran a, a, I think 10,000 instructions we get basic coverage and we can actually have a look at the, the coverage file and see that which instructions which operands and everything we use for that so those are the basic free risk 5 OVP sim and risk 5 OVP sim plus simulators and now what I want to do is show you a little bit of the uh, Imperius commercial tools of simulators, just very briefly, just to introduce you so you, you, you're aware of them. So now I'd like to just show you some of the Imperius uh, technology. So I can go into the Imperius uh, website here, um, imperius.com, and look at the products. So in here, so I can come and I can look in here. The first thing I want to do is to look at the... Uh, the simulation that we've got here so let's have a look at the simulation that we've got here so there's a uh, several pages i'm not going to demonstrate too much of this but you've, we've got the simulator explains how it's done explains how it's built and it also talks a little bit about the performance and debugging and we can see it's a very fast simulator and you can look at this we support a whole lot of different uh, processes out there these are the main ones obviously risc 5 3264 bit uh, very very fast there and uh, what we've also got in here is a variety of different tools. So the first thing to, to look at is we have a debugger, which can come with it, which works in sort of three ways in that it can look across the design, across the platform components. It can look across time, so it can trace things over time and, and have such assertions based on time, but also it can look at an abstraction. So it's a pretty sophisticated uh, debug tool. And the way that the system works is you run the simulator with the simulation models there and then you have a variety of different tools that can work it and one of the areas that we've got tools is in verification analysis and profiling and if we look just um, up here to that we, we, we see here that we've got um, uh, in our verification analysis profiling tools we've got um, tools to trace sort of function calls profiling where uh, all the different time is spent in the in the um, execution of the programs through to instruction profiling and co-coverage and things like that now i'm just going to give a little demonstration here of of some of the things that we've got so the first thing i've got is a um, a very simple um, uh, example so if i'm just going to go to the, our Imperius installation and we have a demo, di demo directory which here has a uh, processes on it i'm just going to go in this example i'm just going to go into a sci-5 one we've got a variety of different families there and if we look at the u7 lot we'll see that that we've got um, a u74 in there so let's have a go in there and have a look at that we'll see again we've got a lot of uh, examples to provide there in there and what we can do is run different things so this is a simple processor running a simple example running a processor and executing that so i'm just going to run that on an example to just to show performance so this is a uh, an integer register operation program so running 28 billion instructions there ran over 9 billion instructions a second on my regular desktop so it's extremely fast so that's running a, a single processor on a single uh, machine what i can also do is um, run my different cores in a simulation actually on a the different cores of the host machine so if i um, go into uh, another directory here we'll see we've got several examples and here instead of just running one um, processor in a simulation we can say actually run four processors so it sort of duplicates that up so if i run that so i'm running four processors in one simulation running dry stones and we'll see uh, that that we still get very fast simulations this is running um, four million uh, loops for each one so again we've got four different processes running in the simulation each uh, ran uh, five billion odd instructions so overall we saw 20 billion instructions go through so that's pretty good so now what i can do is i can actually 
uh, run it in our um, uh, the quantum leap, our parallel mode. So we're running each processor actually in the simulation on a different host core on my machine. Again, same amount of events, same simulation, this time extremely fast. So that's a much faster way to do it. So the Imperial tools give you fast simulation, very sophisticated debug, a lot of verification and analysis. So that was a quick introduction to the simulators. OK, so now let's have a look at what's available in terms of architectural validation and test suites. So these are what are called sort of directed tests, and really they're sort of collections of bare metal test programs. There's no operating systems and things, and they utilize specific instructions in specific ways to stimulate the device under test. And the purpose is really to explore how the behaviors and architectures uh, are working in that device under test, and, and then some way of validating those. And they tend to focus on certain um, common instruction usage and, and corner cases. And they tend to be packaged in, in subsets uh, around different ISA modes normally. And they can be pretty simplistic through to uh, on the general spec all the way through to detailed microarchitectural tests. And when you're looking at test suites, you need to really evaluate their effectiveness in terms of what they cover, their configurability and their quality. And you need to see which ISIS sections they, they cover and whether they're um, relocatable and things like that, how, how, how many tests there are, specific instructions and what the quality is. And then you need to work out how you're going to, to, to validate these tests. Some of them will be self-checking, some of them require a signature and some of them will require some form of reference compare. I'm going to now uh, talk through and show some examples of several. I'm going to start with the Berkeley ones, talk a little bit about the compliance group ones, talk about some Empiris ones we've got, and then some uh, fuzz tests that are available. With the um, RISC V tests, which originally came out of Berkeley, um, the interesting thing about them is so they're self checking tests, um, they're available on the GitHub, which is up here, and they have so obviously integer tests and things, but the, the interesting thing is they have floating point tests in there, but also they have user and super level tests, supervisor level tests. So, so they're, they're worth looking at from that point of view. And they're, they're kept up to date uh, by the team there. The second uh, set of tests are the uh, RISC-V um, compliance tests, which are currently under process. So we exp I explained a little bit about those earlier. And again, remember that these come with a signature. So they've got uh, the source and the signature. So they're compared um, uh, post simulation um, compared. So and it, there are several uh, working groups working on uh, different tests and things and uh, we've um, taken the tests from the uh, bit manipulation group and the uh, crypto group and um, we've done some runs on those so what i was going to do is actually just just uh, show some of these running so um, basically what i've got is some some scripts set up here so this is running the risk five bit manipulation test that's compiling executing and then running through our analysis and doing coverage on them to see to see what they are and these are taken from the the, the github from risk five um uh, working group there and then running those uh, through the empiris uh, simulator and uh, test framework so that we can see what they are and so we can see there's some i don't know 60 different tests um here for there and if we just look at some of the, the coverage, so this both the the 32 uh, bit and the 64 bit, and we can see that uh, if we look at the 32 bit, just looking at the mnemonics, there's actually a, oh, I know, what's that, five instructions uh, not covered yet. Now, partially this is because it's work in progress, um, um, but there are some tests that, that some instructions that are not tested in, in that compliance check, and also the 64 bit, there's uh, 11. Um, tests that aren't done and we can see if we were to look inside uh, one of the the uh, the reports on the coverage we can see that for the instructions it lists what the operands are and you can see that a few of the operands are actually used in the a2 the s6 but the majority of them are not and so that so that's you know it's, it's a work in progress um, that one now we can also do a similar thing for the um, the uh, crypto group and run th their tests uh, through this. So this is there's less of these. There's about 20 different tests for the uh, crypto, and this is the crypto scaler. And again, we can see that um, 
But actually here, in this case, all of their instructions are actually tested, both at the 32-bit and 64-bit. But again, if we were to look at the actual coverage that's being um, uh, reported for this, they're not really trying to, to get coverage here. They're testing the functionality. So it doesn't matter for, from a, a functionality point of view which um, operands are being used, as long as the results are correct. And they're testing that one quite heavily. But you know, for a compliance test, it would want to test all of the uh, of those in there. So, so that's a, a, the, the bit manipulation and the crypto. If we just have now a look at the Empiris test, so we provide some tests on our um, on the GitHub and also on our OVP World downloads. And we have yes, we've got the 32 bit um, IMC and the 64 bit IMC, and um, these are what we call extended tests. And there's actually a lot of instructions are tested in there, and the coverage is very high, and so they're high quality ones. What I'm going to talk about now is actually the vectors. Um, we can see there's there's many different vector suites in here. Some of them have you know um, uh, let's have a look, we're testing certain instructions, 15 instructions, 300 files, 300 test files. Some of them are quite large, 2,500 uh, tests in here. And so here we are looking at the um, 32 vector integer ones. And if we look at that, we can see we've got reports on how um, how, how big the data sizes and program sizes. So you know under about 20k. Uh, bytes, these programs will run it in the target and test a certain number of instructions. And there's two and a half thousand of these tests um, there. If we wanted to see a little more details, we can see that actually in this test suite, it runs about one and a half, the whole suite runs one and a half million instructions. It tests 152 of the instructions of the vector set. And we can see what how many of each instruction in each class was actually um, used and tested uh, in this test suite. And if we look at the uh, coverage, we, we provide uh, coverage reports on it. We can see that actually our tests use all of the different operands in there for the instructions. So we can actually um, ha have a look at this running. So an example, for example, here we have uh, one of the vector tests uh, suites going to run. This is the um, the 32VM test. So that's it actually running, compiling. Now it's doing the verification of the signature. And there were 264 tests that were actually run in that. And if we then now run uh, the coverage on it, we'll see that actually we get uh, all the instructions are tested and extremely high um, coverage on it. And if we want to look at one of these tests, we can see the details of it. Now, one of the things about the vectors is the, the vector engines are very configurable. So this is an XLEN of 32, and it has a VLEN of 256, an SLEN of 256, and an ELEN of 32. So this is version 0.8 of these. And we can see when we look through the instructions, and this is a, one of the, the good thing about our tests is that we can see what the input operands are and the values we're expecting for the different settings. But also we can see what the output registers are we're expecting before and after the instruction is executed. So it's very good from a debug point of view. And then we have a lot of assertions in here so that when it's running, you can really see what the values are expected to, to be and everything. So that's some, something we've been doing. Now, um, the, the last thing to, I wanted to look at is the um, fuzz testing that, uh, that I mentioned. And so this is um, the university and a group in, from Bremen in Germany has been doing this. And what they basically said is that, you know, handwritten tests are good from a compliance point of view, but actually um, they test, and that's testing the positive. But what they were interested in, what negative testing and, and to check that things and how they responded under the wrong uh, instructions and things. And so what they did, they did a lot of testing there. And um, what I've done is I'm not going to run them here because there's an awful lot of tests. There's 8,000 tests in their sort of specification tests, which is, it, we, 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 we've been using here. And when we run those through the coverage, um, through the simulation, obviously that this is them passing and they pass all the, the, the references they have. You know, they test almost all the instructions um, in the um, in the instruction set and extremely high quality. And if we were to actually just look and see the basic coverage of what what oh, sorry what they've got. Okay, so I haven't got that file there. I've already deleted it. So um, um, it, we we could have a look and see that that, that it actually is very few of the instructions are actually uh, missed. And actually, here's the list of the coverage points that were missed. So obviously, branch to self you can't test easily and e break. So very few points were missed. So that's extremely high quality testing from and these are 
automatically generated. And there's a lot of those, there's 8,000. And then they have their fuzz test, which is trying to find out what's wrong with a model in terms of how it behaves in the illegal conditions. So this is good for the RTL or good for the, a model. So they've got some 13,000 tests in there. And when they run, yeah, it doesn't cover all the instructions. It's not aiming for coverage because it's testing for illegal conditions. And the interesting thing is uh, when they did that, they couldn't, didn't have access to a lot of RTL, but what they had is access obviously to reference models, simulator models. So um, they, they used as a reference uh, our simulator risk 5 OVP sim for this. And this is a paper they presented actually at DAC at the Design Automation Conference this year. And then they tested against the spike and their own virtual platform simulator to sail and grew formal models. And they found several bugs and, and issues and crashes and things with each of these, these models here. So these are a really good bunch of tests. And so there's some 8,000 um, of the uh, spec tests and in, in this slot there's some um, 13,000. So there's some 20,000 tests for this. And we're putting them, going to be putting them into our um, Imperius uh, test suites that are going to be available so that they're available for everybody to be able to use. Okay, so let's talk about instruction stream generators. So an instruction stream test generator is a tool which takes a variety of inputs and generates streams of instructions either in C um, or in assembler. You put those through your tool chain, get an ELF file out, you run it through your RTL Verilog design under test, get a log file, you run it through your reference simulator, for example, in Pyrrhus here, and get a log file, and then you do a post simulation compare. Generator needs a bit of information about the device under test, needs to know what instructions to focus on, needs information about the reference model typically, some list of configurations for the test, some randomization constraints, and then you get your tests out. What makes a good instruction stream generator is randomness, so it can get everything in terms of instructions, the ordering, the program structures. It needs to be architecture aware so it can hit corner cases. It needs to be high performance so it can scale and build large programs in short periods of time. And it needs to be extendable for adding new instructions. That's a slide from uh, Google about their generator that they've uh, presented a couple of times at this summit and they are presenting uh, actually this week. A generator flow isn't as simple as just generating a single instruction. Complex engines like the vector engine needs quite a lot of setup before you can have legal instructions. So it's not just a matter of random instructions and random operands. Here's an example again from Google with some 12 stages to generating legal programs. So now you know, I, I, there's about four or five um, current test generators that a lot of people talk about. Uh, the Google's talked about a lot, as I said, they're presenting here. The RISC V torture one is, is um, quite old now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the open hardware and Valtrix. Um, I should mention here, there is a paper at this conference on the uh, ISPRAS ones. It's the Institute of System Programming from the Russian Academy of Science on theirs, which is actually an interesting one with the um, specification that's in NML and uh, the programs are in Ruby. But now I'm going to talk about Force RISC V and Valtrix. Fortress 5, this is um, from the open hardware GitHub and was developed initially by Futureway and is now uh, part of the open hardware uh, flow of tools. And it, it's currently targeting the uh, RV64, they're working at the moment on the 32. And um, if you go to the GitHub, you can look, download it and use it. And it works with the Imperial Simulator RISC V OVP sim out of the box and will run so you can generate tests and then run it. Um, it's a uh, pretty sophisticated uh, uh, test generator. It's written in C++. Um, it's got a lot of options and, and it's driven. It's a C++ generator, but it's actually driven from uh, Python sequences. So you, you control it from Python. So what I'm going to do now is, is give, give a demonstration of this. So Forcer is five. So I've downloaded and installed it on my machine and you get a variety of directories, uh, a binary that you have to, to build up and make and uh, um, documentation and a lot of examples. It comes with Python scripts to, to drive it. And I'm not actually going to, to run it because it takes some uh, 20 something seconds. So I, I ran it earlier and it ran for 26 seconds to generate uh, 157 ELF files. Look at the L files, and I can see them in the directory that, that have been generated. And so we can do that. But what I'm going to do is now just show one uh, running. So this 
we'll go to a different directory here and you, you drive it as I said from uh, Python so it's very simple to run so I can just run the generator here that's the generator running it generated a lot of instructions you can see it's uh, very fast we've got an elf file directly out so there's no separate compile stage with this and then um, if I look at the uh, simulation we're just going to run it through RISC-V OVP sim 64-bit uh, ISO we're going to run with options set in it and we're actually going to run some coverage and get the coverage that um, uh, we we're going to measure so we run it through the simulator and you can see um, it, it was one single test is all we ran and it uh, some 4,000 instructions and, and, it, and it gets coverage from that so for Swiss 5 it, it's very fast to run and it's very configurable from Python a lot of API's to use so that's a very simple introduction to it so now what I'm going to do is to switch to have a look at uh, a company called Valtrix their product sting and this is a commercial product and it's ext an extremely fast test generator which generates code that runs on your device under test and it's like portable stimulus and it actually one of the things that's very interesting and that's the website for it one of the things that's very interested is that it yes it's constrained random but it's also graph based so it allows you to do direct sequences and then drive those with constrained random or have random sequences driven by directed so it's very interesting in that way and it gives you a lot of control over the tests that are generated so um, if I just run this, I've actually, I'm not going to run the generator. I don't have it here. What I do have is some of the ELF files that it's generated. And I can just, uh, I've just generated a script which just runs them. It runs them through the simulator so we can see that it, run, it runs. And it's, um, you know, so it runs, each test is sort of 10 to 20,000 uh, instructions. And out of the 210 instructions we're looking at, it's covered a lot of them, which is pretty good. And we've actually, this was running the uh, what is it? it's a 64 bit so it's uh, running 64 bit IMC also the CSRs the fence iron instruction and then actually in this case it was running all the bit manipulation stuff as well so very powerful very fast test generator gets very good coverage Okay, having had a look at instruction stream generators, now let's have a look at what you need in your test bench and what verification IP you need. Okay, so the first thing you're going to need is your reference model. We talked a little bit about that. You're also going to need some functional coverage, and we talked a little bit about that, and uh, I showed you something that is built into the Imperial simulators. We can also, um, in the system Verilog world, we can generate source for system Verilog cover groups and cover points based on the ISO extensions based on our simulators uh, coverage so we have a tool to build uh, system Verilog source for you if you want it and then there's the verification IP blocks and that's what I'm going to be talking about here's an example of a test bench and we'll see more of that later in the walkthrough in the next couple of slides and this is where instead of running the design under test and the uh, reference model one after the other and comparing the log we bring them together in the same test bench so that on every, on every instruction they're comparing things and so it's very different and more effective it's more complicated but much more effective now what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about several of the components first is the tracer and Lee's going to explain a little bit more about that it gets the information out of the RTL and into the test bench as part of the test bench has to synchronize it with the um, reference model and then we have to compare the results out okay so now i'm going to pass you to my colleague lee moore who's going to walk through the um, simulation of a core rtl with a uvm test bench and all the issues related to verification of it so what I'm going to show here is the environment that's been constructed as part of the Open Hardware CV32E40P UVM test bench, whereby we have an instantiation of the RTL representing the processor core and a reference model implemented by a configured envelope model from within the OVP environment. Together, these run in a UVM test bench whereby we capture internal state of both the RTL and the reference model, and we do some comparison. So looking at this diagram here, you'll see we have this module called the tracer that sits on the uh, output side of the RTL. And this is, this is extracting data from within the DUT 
at the po at the necessary points such as the retirement of instructions to extract the register state and then we do the same on the reference model from the OVP RISC-5 uh, reference implementation and it goes into a comparison routine and when the compare fails at any point then we're alerted immediately through the UVM messaging system telling us that an error has occurred and been captured and the, the 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 execution of this is really sat there as a monitor running in the background that's observing the execution of any of the test cases that have been produced from the suites of tests both directed and uh, random instruction stream generation stimulus so let's just have a quick look at how how we can do some analysis using this environment the first thing i want to show here is the known good usage case of executing the applications in this environment and there's a routine called the continuous integration check-in which is something that's executed prior to committing any changes to the repository to be merged by the maintainers so let's just have a look at the execution of these tests in the UVM test bench with both the RTL and the RISC-V reference model from OVP running together and being compared. So here what we're showing is the execution of the continuous integration check-in tests which we've speeded up for demonstration purposes. This normally takes about five minutes to execute and it's a subset of smoke tests and once you've actually run through these this gives you some confidence that you can check in any changes you've made either to the design or to the tests themselves. Of course running batch mode simulation and sign-off simulations is usually the end of the process the majority of the time is actually spent in the development phase and so let's take a look at the tools that we have available to us for giving us both the software and a hardware view of both the reference model and the RTL within this environment. So let's look at the components that form this environment. So typically what we have is some application that's been created either through a directed test flow or through an automated test generation instruction stream generator flow which goes through a co compiler and produces uh, both an elf and a hex representation for loading into the platform and in the case of the RTL of course we have we just have a hex file that's loaded into memory but the uh, Imperus ISS representation model will take the ELF file because it can also perform debug activities and there's data included inside the ELF to help with with that capability and so the these two representations run together concurrently and perform step and compare as part of this this test bench so let's show how we can debug this type of environment using the tools we have at our disposal so let's have a look at what we can use in terms of this UVM test bench for debug purposes. Well, there are two debug views effectively available to us. One is the traditional RTL type debugger, which looks at net signals, registers. And then we also have the view of the software executing on the core, which in this case is the instantiation of the reference model from the OVP library. And so you can see here, we have uh, a debugger, software debugger, that gives us this view. Uh, let's put this into instruction stepping mode. And what I can do is if I step through sort of 10 instructions at a time, you'll notice that, um, first of all, I get a trace out here. So this trace is, is quite important because the, this gives us, you know, quite low level visibility into the uh, detailed workings of the core registers, program counter, and operating mode. So you can see here it's reporting that we're currently executing in machine mode, we've executed an AUI PC, and the value of the GP register has changed value uh, from this initial value to this value here. And we get that, or we can produce that uh, for, for every instruction that gets executed and retired in, in our environment here. So I'm gonna go into both of these views and, and show you uh, the, the different kinds of things that you can look at in terms of the internal uh, state that's exposed out through to the System Verilog UVM test bench. So let's take a more detailed look at the uh, MPDE GUI debugger, which connects into the reference model executing inside the System Verilog uh, test bench. And what you'll notice here, there's a number of windows available. Um, 
so we have a, um, a view of the operating stack that's executing and we can move up and down that stack. And as you see, all the windows change context uh, or contextualized in terms of what we've got selected at this point here. So for example, we have our register view window here. And so these registers, the values inside of them, which are part of the, um, which are part of the RISC-V uh, implementation, you will see that these actually would change values. We go up and down the stack because the calling frame will, will uh, save those register values in order to be retrieved when you return from an instruct from a function. Now, in terms of hardware, uh, you don't have this same view, of course. In, in hardware, you only have a, a register that represents the current state of uh, a general purpose register. It doesn't tell you the value of the register as it was placed on the stack at the point where a call or return occurred. And we have a similar view here. We call this the programmer's view. And so in here, where we look at these core registers, um, then these are the actual values in the physical representation of the register as it would be seen in the RTL. And it's these registers that we expose out through our APIs into the system Verilog domain so that they can be used as part of the step and compare functionality. But we, we also maintain more extensive data inside of here as well that is not normally associated with uh, the, the, the visibility of the state of the processor. And so some examples of this would be things such as uh, the operating mode that we're in. We can see here we're operating in machine mode. Uh, in terms of the operating modes of this particular core, it can operate in both machine and debug mode, and this would be reflected in this view here whenever we switch context into one of those uh, operating modes. We have the state of the general purpose core registers in terms of what their values are at this particular moment in time, but also we have things such as the machine control and status registers available to us as well. So a pretty extensive programmer's view in terms of the internal state at this point here but also you know this is this is a, a, a fully fledged debugger which gives us access to both the source code the disassembly and the state of the registers and we can also as i said before move up and down the stack as we're executing code and so if i was to start stepping through the code we would see that uh, the, the windows would update accordingly as we step through and uh, we get different values in registers and our program counter moves on through the code. Incidentally, if I was just to uh, drop this down a little bit, you'll see that in from the hardware view as well, that the windows are also updating in the back here as the uh, states of these um, uh, variables which are shared across into the system Verilog domain are, are updated and made visible to the step and compare. Um, so let's let's just go in a little bit more detail here. I've got a breakpoint set actually. I think on on main. Um, I've got it on printf as well. So I should be able to just continue to that point. So here we are. So now we've uh, continued to uh, the first instruction, which is executing in main. Um, and so as I was to step, you know, if I was to step through that code there, we would see both the um, debug window for the instruction traces updating as well as what we have over in the view for the system Verilog uh, capability. But what I'm actually going to do at this point here, I'm going to step across and start running the code from the perspective of the RTL. And so here, these three signals at the top you see are the uh, export or the, these are a subset of exported values of the internal state of the reference model and it's these that are compared against the internal state of the RTL so I'm going to change the stepping mode here so if I was to step across let's zoom in on an area here so what you actually see here is uh, this is the retired program counter PCR this is the retired uh, instruction uh, that indicates the uh, instruction from the reference model's perspective. And this is then used to compare in the step and compare module against the RTL's version of this. And what you notice is as we sort of step across, you'll see that, let's zoom out a little bit actually so we can see this happening. As we uh, step through, you'll see that the general purpose registers as well, let me just open those up, would also get updated. And these are sort of reflected from whatever the instructions are that are being executed at these uh, at these instruction points so there we see an update there to GPR2 
And so all of those general purpose registers are exposed out in addition to our CSRs as well. So the RISC-V processor specification encompasses a, uh, a wide range of CSRs of which some of these are implemented in CV32E40P. And so the reference model has the same um, representation of that and can export them out for comparison purposes. So that's that's how we see these values in here that are getting compared inside that module. What I've shown so far is um, the execution at the very beginning of the continuous integration flow. I've also shown the interactive use for, for what you could use for developing your tests, but also for debugging your tests as well. What I wanted to show is the kind of symptoms you see when things are not working as you would uh, either expect or hope them to be. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to deliberately introduce an error into the RTL code to show you the effect and, and how you can use this flow in order to determine the resolution. So what I'm showing here is the arithmetic logic unit of the CV32E40P. Um, what we have here are two of the possible uh, use cases of the ALU where it performs a less than signed or a set of a bit in a register for a less than signed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to corrupt this by removing those two conditions in this uh, switch statement that we have here. So I'm hoping that that's going to change the behavior. And rather than using the full set of um, check-in tests, what I'm going to do is run a subset, which is this, this test called the sanity test. In fact, it is, it's nothing more than a hello world example. Um, and so what this is going to do, same as before, it's going to run both the RTL microarchitectural and the reference model uh, abstract architectural model and compare the two. And here we see it's reported as failed. Now, if we go back through and look at what was reported, we get these UVM errors messages coming out. And these are the things that are important. So remember, this is a UVM test bench that's performing uh, step and compares. And this is the important bit. It's telling us that we've spotted a point where the program counter in the um, reference model, the expected, is 55D0, but the actual is 5654. Well, that doesn't give us a lot of information to go on at this point, but what we can do, remember we've got all those great debug features that I showed earlier. Let's turn on the very basic one and just say, let's get some tracing out and see what happens at this point, and let's rerun. So now we should get the uh, instruction disassembly, register dumping, and the... Um, uh, the, the operating mode dumped out to the screen for the reference model. So let's just see what's different at this point. So here we go. So what we've seen is that the expected PC was 55D0, where the actual PC was 5654. Uh, so you can see here, this is what we've executed on the reference model. We've executed this load word instruction. And the in instruction prior to this was a branch if less than or zero. And so what, we sh what we're seeing here is that the reference model has not taken the branch, so it's ran the instruction following this, whereas in the case of the RTL, what's happened is it has taken the branch. It's actually gone off to 5654. So straight away, because we're doing step and compare, you know, we've immediately homed in on what the problem is here. It's the result of our branch if less than zero. And if we go back to our original RTL code, you'll recall that this is exactly the thing that I put in a corruption for. So just to prove that this is truly the case, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to um, take out the tracing and let's just run it one more time and be absolutely certain that this executes to completion without any UVM errors. And in fact, all we should see is the printing of the hello world string from the application itself and there we go so it tells us that it's passed and it prints out the text here to summarize what we've seen here is we've taken an ovp representation of a cv32e40p tailored model from our envelope risk 5 implementation We've embedded that within a UVM test bench to be used as a reference to compare against the RTL. And we can do this because we can expose out all of the internal states, such as the 
general purpose registers, the CSRs, and we can also accurately um, control the asynchronous inputs as well to ensure that the two stay in sync. This is a very powerful method of performing your design verification, but still allows you to maintain usage of the tools for debugging and designing the tests that will form part of your suite as in your verification plan. Great, thanks for that um, walkthrough, Lee. One of the last things you do within the design before you sign it off is you run benchmarks on it in an operating system. So now I'm just going to show you a couple of operating systems uh, running on our reference models. We have several uh, examples that we can show where a model can be run in uh, a platform with an operating system running. The first one we're going to show is um, an Andes model running. So it's the, an Andes N25 going to run with some memory, timer and some UARTs and that's going to run the uh, free RTOS in there. So I'll obviously up and then there it's running and it's actually just writing to the to the uh, console here to the to the UART. Um, there wasn't any input I could do and we had some almost 9 billion instructions. So it's very fast uh, running at about the, effectively a gigahertz, which is pretty good for an embedded system um, in there. So let's have a look at a, a, a different example here. This time, uh, this one's a Sci-5. This is a multi-core one. So this is where we have a, um, an FE540 type of board here with a virtual platform with um, 30U54. So it's a, a multi-core processor running. So we run that, you can see there it's booting Linux in this console. Once it's booted Linux, I need to get in there and type um, it's that. I've got the uh, password in there. So what is it, cat slash. We can see there's five cores in there. We can run it, we can see it's an operating system running. It's very fast and efficient. And it was running on multiple cores there. Um, we didn't run too long, but it's very quick and efficient. And just just to wrap up, just um, so that's a multi-core platform. Actually, you can run um, a heterogeneous uh, system as well with our simulation environment. For example, this is an example of a, um, an AI machine learning process that, that uh, one of our customers working on, which has multiple risk five um, cores, 64-bit GCs. There's actually 17 or 18 of them there. And it also runs with an ARM uh, controller in, in one simulation. And we can uh, run that up here. And while that's running, I mean, we can see you know, the type of thing we're going to run is, that is actually a neural network going through it in here. And so it's 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 running and uh, there's actually a console uh, which is doing convolution and doing the different things for you there, which I can, uh, if I kill that here, we can see that uh, there's you know, 16, 17 hearts and 17 processors to have running with ARM. So it's, we can do heterogeneous simulations as well. Okay, so we're now at the end of the tutorial. So thank you very much for staying with us here. Just to sort of summarize, you know, we've sort of tried to explain a little bit about the methodologies, flows, and the challenges of um, verification of RISC-V CPUs. We've introduced reference models, talked about our configurable model, showed some free simulation test suites and, and the compliance suite, talked about instruction stream generators and showed some demonstrations of those explained a little bit about our commercial simulators and test suites and really focused on advanced verification tools and methodologies and explored a UVM test bench which is available actually on the GitHub for you to explore with the RTL of a core. Empiris is not just about a CPU model, we actually have all the models of course, we also are involved with customers with methodology, with tools, with training resources. So if you really want to explore advanced risk five verification of course then please do contact us and for more information here's um, some of the links to things that i've talked about from empiris from tests on the instruction test generators test benches reference models i put a couple of links here to empiris videos so please do contact us if you want more information thank you